Hey guys, the purpose of this video is to cover things that we did not cover in didactic that will be on your exam on Monday. And one of those is the exemplar of lung cancer. And I'm going to attempt to make this video relatively short, um, but to hit over the high points that you need to know for your exam. The first thing to know is what's on this first slide is that lung cancer is as we have stated already a couple times, the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the U.S. These are some statistics for you as far as 2018 statistics. It affects men and women equally. Um, this is how many new cases are expected of lung cancer in 2018, and how many deaths from lung cancer are expected in 2018. It's the leading cause of cancer death among both men and women than all of these three cancers combined. These are the chances of developing cancer in your lifetime, and this does include both smokers and non-smokers. The point that I want you to remember is that for smokers, the risk is much higher. Survival rates depend on how far advanced the cancer is when it is discovered. Um, the earlier stage, the better chance of survival. Risk factors, the primary risk factor is smoking tobacco, and that includes inhaling secondhand smoke. That's 80% of the cause, especially when combined with other risk factors, such as genetic risk factors, uh, family history of lung cancer, and exposure to environmental carcinogens and pollutants, things like radon and asbestos. Of course, non-smokers can also get lung cancer from genetic um, changes and also from exposure to environmental carcinogens and pollutants. Same things, radon, asbestos, and some more examples include diesel exhaust and environmental pollution. The risk of lung cancer is directly related to the exposure to tobacco smoke. Um, and that includes how many were smoked in a lifetime, how early the smoking started, whether or not uh, the smoke is inhaled deeply or just held in the mouth, as well as what kind of cigarettes and whether they were filtered or how much tar and nicotine they had. Remember that secondhand smoke is the same amount of carcinogens as smoking the cigarette yourself. And these are some more inhaled carcinogens and irritants that um, put you at risk for lung cancer. So remember that we want to primarily always encourage our patients to quit smoking. That is um, the most important thing. Yes, it's important even if they can cut back on it, but we want to emphasize to our patients that the best thing that they can do for themselves is to stop smoking altogether. If somebody were to ask you, does this going to lower my risk of lung cancer? Yes, it will. However, because of past exposure, you're still at a higher risk of developing lung cancer than those that have never smoked. Best to also a part of prevention to limit environmental risk as much as possible by wearing PPE, um, things like asbestos or th things that can be um, screened for in the home, asbestos screening, radon, and eradication of that from the home, um, considering not working in a certain industry, lifelong switching jobs, and then screening, the primary screening test, very important to remember for um, individuals at high risk of lung cancer is a CT scan. So just as all of our other cancers, there's some kind of alteration in cellular regulation within the lungs and um, it results in the growth of a tumor. There's non-small lung cancer and small cell lung cancers. Most of them are the non-small cell lung, cell lung cancer, but the small cell lung cancer is very fast, very aggressive, and most consistently linked to a history of cigarette smoking. Sites of metastasis for cancer is anything that's carried through the blood or lymph system, which makes sense because that is so closely related. The lungs are the part of the cardiopulmonary system. So anything that the pulmonary system is involved in is also affected. 
So we're talking about our circulation and that includes circulation of lymph, lymph nodes and lymph fluid. Clinical manifestations. There's um, early and late signs. So the earlier signs and symptoms such as a persistent cough is the number one first sign along with chest pain, shortness of breath, and wheezing. However, these are also things that people experience when they smoke cigarettes. So it's often overlooked because or ignored because it's such a normal part of the person already. They already experience these symptoms all the time anyways. Uh, one of the indicators that can really push somebody into um, getting treatment or looking up uh, seeking help would be the extreme shortness of breath and then when we have bloody sputum. Later signs, just like with all cancers, anorexia, cachexia, extreme fatigue, weight loss, fever of unknown origin, nausea and vomiting, um, and then some special ones related specifically to lung cancer would be hoarseness from laryngeal nerve involvement, uh, superior vena cava syndrome, we'll talk about that in a minute, from uh, the, the mass pressing on the mediastinum or from lymph node involvement in the mediastinum and involved lymph nodes in the neck or region of the axillae, axil so the uh, bilateral um, axillary area. So these are our negative consequences on our, um, if we were to look at that original uh, cellular regulation concept diagram. These are all negative consequences that a person can experience. Your primary diagnostic study, a chest x-ray can be helpful, MRI can be helpful, but your gold standard diagnostic study for lung cancer um, is going to be your CT and your biopsy. Those are your most definitive things. These are other um, a PET scan, again, is usually done after somebody already has a diagnosis of cancer. And sputum cytology can be done, taking see if there are any cancer cells in the sputum. And these other uh, bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, and video-assisted thoracoscopy are all different ways of scoping and the patient looking down into the lungs with the scope. A thoracentesis can be one of those well, what um, thoracentesis is a procedure done for a pleural effusion, and a pleural effusion is a collection of fluid in the lung pleura, which, if there is lung cancer, will show up. The cells, malignant cells, will show up inside of oh, sorry, inside of the uh, cytology report. So when it's we send the fluid off for testing it will come up as um, cancerous. So these are some examples. See on an x-ray, all you have is the shadowing on an x-ray right there in the lungs, but inside of the CT scanner, we can actually get a pretty good picture of this mass as well as any other masses in the lungs. This is to show you what a pleural effusion looks like. All of this is fluid in here. The lungs are supposed to look like this, all black and full of air black and full of air, and this is a large collection of fluid due to uh, a cancerous tumor. And the thoracentesis is the act of putting a needle in between the ribs and drawing out or draining that fluid, and then the lung is allowed to re-expand. Staging for lung cancer is the same as TNM, same as our other cancers. Tumor nodes metastasis site helps assist in our prognosis remember that the worst our tn worse our tnm is the worse the prognosis remember we said that small cell lung cancer is very aggressive so staging is not always the most helpful in determining a treatment method so what do we want to tell our patients stop smoking limit secondhand exposure to smoke, and use PPE to protect the lungs. Screening, that can be done. There is no genetic screening test. 
Um, and if we have a fast growing tumor, it won't necessarily be effective in reducing the mortality rate of lung cancer. So if we think about a screening test as something that's done like on a yearly basis, um, this tumor can develop and metastasize before the next screening test. So as we said with other cancers, um, it is not usually found because we're looking for lung tumors. It's usually an incidental finding. Patient comes in for shortness of breath, maybe has a different kind of health history that leads the ER physician or um, another physician to order a chest x-ray and then a lung tumor is discovered. Sputum cytology, looking at the um, cells and testing for malignant cells in the sputum can also be used as a screening diagnostic tool, but it is not conclusive or absolute. To treat a patient that has lung cancer and inquires, as with many things, the use of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and of course respiratory involvement, which is not surprising. So what was our nursing role? Our nursing role is to obtain a detailed history and physical from the patient. Physical assessment findings may include the mass, the lump, um, the cachexia, muscle wasting. Uh, as far as our lung sounds assessment, lung sounds will be diminished, may be wheezing and coughing, uh, may also sound um, be absent if there is a large pleural effusion or pneumothorax on one side or the other. So our nursing interventions or our nursing diagnosis are going to start with the nursing diagnoses of um, ineffective breathing patterns, maintaining adequate airway clearance, maintaining adequate oxygenation, um, acute pain can be another nursing diagnosis, and then um, helping our patients maintain a realistic attitude towards treatment and prognosis. We'll talk about superior vena cava syndrome in another slide or in another PowerPoint. And then surgical intervention, usually um, in order to remove the mass or the, the tumor, we have to take away part of the lung. So there's different ways this can be done. We, we can accomplish it by um, removing a whole lung, a lobe of the lung, a segment from a lobe, or the removal of peripheral lung tissue itself. The most common ones that I've seen are the lobectomies and the wedge resections. So pre-procedure care, we pay close attention to coagulation studies because those are clotting studies. So we are going to be cutting into the lungs and remember the lungs are very vascular because all the blood runs through there and picks up oxygen. Pulmonary function tests can be done to determine the functioning of what's going to be left over from, of lung tissue. A baseline echocardiogram, assessing the patient's baseline um, metabolic status. Remember that the kidneys are also, and the liver are also very involved in blood filtering. So getting a baseline status for those. And then CBC to get a baseline status for infection. Anesthesia type for the patient is going to be general anesthesia. And then their post-operative expectations can include that the patient um, will have a chest tube. And that is because there will still be bleeding and fluid collection inside of the area of the lobectomy, the pneumonectomy, or the wedge resection. Patients may need a possible blood transfusion and possibly be intubated. So our nursing interventions, our post-operative nursing care, of course, is going to be mon uh, monitoring vital signs with our focus on our um, SpO2 saturation and ABGs. We may have to administer oxygen. We'll manage the chest tube drainage system. If they're on a ventilator, they'll be in the ICU and that will be uh, managed. The patient is best put in Fowler's position to maximize ventilation. And we do want to promote healing through with good nutrition, frequent rest, and smoking cessation. So this is to give you an idea about chest tubes. They go, the tube goes in between a rib up into the lung. Here's an example of a chest tube if you haven't seen one. This is a very full drainage system, and that's how big, like these 32 Frenchers, French um, tubes into the lungs. So that's lung cancer and nursing care, pre, post-op, prevention, and interdisciplinary care.